on, Mac. Here we go again. Okay. Hiya, gal. Good news, isn't it? Yeah, those fortresses sure can dish it out. And bring the boys home safe, too. When news of the successful raid by the flying fortresses comes in, these are the people who get the biggest thrill, the thousands of Boeing workers who build them. They are the makers of flight. rivets and rivet guns, with hard-biting routers, with their own two hands. In huge Boeing plants, out of tough metal, they forge America's fighting bomber. The Army Air Forces take over. And from the field, she takes off to join the fighting forces. Flying Fortress. Where did it all start? How did America have this plane ready when war came? Well, in the lean years of the early 30s, Boeing designers, thinking of tomorrow's airplane, talk of a huge military plane. Tough, fast, and rangy. It'd be hard to build, they say. A lot of problems to lick. Think of the mechanical problems. How big the landing gear must be to carry those tons and tons of weight. She'd need four mighty motors to give her extra power, extra speed, and extra punch. And the controls, wouldn't a pilot get dizzy trying to handle them all? It looked as if the plane would always remain a dream. But in 1934, when the Army Air Corps asked for new bomber designs, the Boeing men went to work in earnest. They figure her size and weight anew. She'll cost a lot to build and there's a depression on. Shall they tackle a brand new field, cut loose from the past? Shall they build tomorrow's plane today? The decision is made. These are the men to do it. For 18 years, from 1916 to 1934, they had been pioneering constantly improving aircraft design. They built America's first low-wing monoplane transport, the famous monomail. The United States Army's first all-metal two-engine bomber, the B-9. And the first modern type commercial transport, the 247. 
Here was the plane of tomorrow, the fortress that is to come. And the plane of the future has to be translated to the details of the big plane itself. This wing truss design must be light, yet strong enough to carry the load of four huge motors and the plane itself. And every thought the pilot has must be made to flow along a network of controls. But the job was done. And in July 1935, she took off. Boeing 299, you are clear to take off. You are clear to the control boundary. She flew non-stop to Dayton for her army test, breaking all speed records. Designed to be the guardian of a hemisphere, she had a greater cruising range than any bomber ever built. This 1934 plane forecasts today's great fortresses of the sky, which carry ever larger loads of bombs and bristle with guns. Army orders 13 planes to give them a service test. The engineers who went all out for a plane of the future win their point. But problems of aircraft design and manufacture are no sooner solved than others appear. For without continuous research, today's super plane can be as outmoded as this jalopy. The engineers work constantly to step up speed, altitude, stability, make the great fortress function like a precision instrument. make a scale model of the big plane and mount it in the throat of a wind tunnel. There, in a man-made gale, they duplicate real flight conditions. And in the balance room of the tunnel, you can read the story of the flight. To study performance of a new wing, the engineers will watch these tufts of yarn as they react to the airflow. The wind roars through the tunnel. And as the model simulates a stall, the even flow of air breaks into whirling eddies. Through research such as this, they continually build up new data on airplane performance and design. Improve, revise, redesign. Your fortress flies faster, but anti-aircraft guns are reaching higher now. How are you going to get above their deadly range? Above 18,000 feet. The air becomes too thin to breathe. Without a normal supply of oxygen, the human system doesn't function efficiently. At 25,000 feet, even the engines gasp for breath. At 35,000 feet, the mercury drops to 60 below. Oil freezes and lubricated controls won't work freely. Well, that's the stratosphere. And to beat it, Boeing engineers bring the stratosphere down to Earth and duplicate conditions existing more than eight miles up. Into the strata chamber they go to test the performance of equipment at high altitude. They read the story of the test on a battery of pressure gauges. And for a test in the cold room, 
Huge refrigeration machines chill the air down to 75 below and lower. These equipment engineers, dressed for the stratosphere even though they'll never leave the ground, are going to test a valve to see whether it will work in such intense cold. No, it won't work. Not in the sub-zero temperature of the stratosphere. Well, better to have it freeze now than when the plane is in the air. But it means figuring and testing and tinkering until they find controls that will always work. It's 70 below in there. And what wouldn't they give for a hot cup of coffee? Okay, coming up. <whistles> Too late. Coffee, popsicle style. But flight research isn't all done on the ground. Boeing flight test engineers have spent more time, about 35,000 feet, than any other group of engineers in the world. They scrape the stratosphere, getting the answers that make the Flying Fortress a better combat plane. So, day by day, the big bombers mature, lifting bigger loads, flying faster and further, higher, higher into the blue. But the search for perfection is never-ending. In the sound laboratory, acoustical engineers study sound-producing vibration, from high-pitched whines to deafening clatters. And with this knowledge, they go to work on the plane itself, quelling engine noise, cutting out other causes of sound. And then in the factory, what can't be killed is muffled until the roar of the engines is hushed to a purr. The big bomber is as quiet as the average streamlined train. And what did these six years of pre-war research mean to a world that was still at peace? Well, out of research such as this, commercial as well as military, comes the big Boeing Clipper, the ship that established transoceanic plane service on a commercially practical basis. And the Boeing Stratoliner, the world's first high-altitude, completely pressurized commercial airplane. But for years, the flying fortresses are a subject for controversy. They're expensive for a peacetime budget, and they have never been tested in combat. But with faith in their own design, in their vision of the future, Boeing kept on, testing, experimenting, improving. America is attacked. at war. What mighty weapon have we got? What war birds have we hatched? The army's flying fortresses are ready. They take to the air, laden with steel for enemy targets. Speed, altitude, precision gunfire are all at their command. Striking in broad daylight, they become the plane best able to get to the target, hit the target, and get back again. Now, with our country at war, a new problem comes up. America needs hundreds, thousands of fortresses. Can it be done? Boeing production engineers are ready for that too. 
their unique multiple line assembly system rolled into action at a faster tempo. By breaking down the ship into these seven major sub assemblies and completing each on a separate line, they were making better use of available floor space. Prefabrication on a massive scale. Complete the parts as separate units, then bring them together. The system turned out more production per square foot than any other aircraft factory. Here, in giant forms as big as a house, inboard sections of the wings are built. Then, after the engines have been mounted and controls installed, the wings join the fuselage. But, fast as they roll out, our war machine calls for more. More parts, more planes. So Boeing tooling engineers look for new ways to make more parts, faster. For instance, here are some of the ribs of a flying fortress. The old way of making these parts was too slow. So they invent an octopus monster to bite into metal. Turn out those ribs 45 times faster. and they develop an automatic spot welding table that a woman can run. Now this former housewife stitches the metal hide for the toughest bomber in the world. But skeleton and skin are not enough. To complete these giant fighting bombers, nerves are needed. Nerves to call for more speed and power, to tell the guns to bark and the bombs to fall, and send back the message, mission accomplished. That means electric wires. Five miles or more for every fortress. Once thousands of wires were hauled individually through conduits. Too slow, they say. So Boeing men speeded it up with a new system. Whole sections of the nervous systems are bundled together outside the plane. Then they're installed quickly as a unit. Through the plant, the tempo quickens. Faster machines are made, more efficient tools. America and the whole world needs those planes. The call for better, faster production methods goes out. And in the shops, the men and women who are giving their time and their muscle, they give their ideas, too. They're gathered from suggestion boxes all over the huge plant. They pour them in. One man develops a new grommet punch. And thanks to him, Boeing fortresses are built faster. And somebody thought of a way to number parts as they're cut. This little gadget saves untold hours. And in growing numbers, women are taking over in the plants, replacing men who have gone off to war. These women used to drive the family car. Now they're driving Hitler. Crazy. And obeying all the rules of safety, too. This inspector checks hard to see rivets inside the huge wing. Eternal feminine. Here they are, Americans at work. Housewives and farmers, mechanics and teachers, all races and all creeds, young and old alike. 
each contributes to the building of the bomber that has been called the backbone of the American air offensive. They're sending out a steady flow of fortresses. Australia, India, Africa, Alaska they go, making it possible to hit the enemy by day as well as by night, in ever-increasing numbers striking at the heart of the target. The Bombay doors open. away. While the mighty fortresses of the sky strike the enemy again and again, Boeing's engineering staff, one of the largest ever assembled by a single industrial concern, is building still better weapons for war. Secret weapons. And what of peace? Out of Boeing research in hydraulics and structures, aerodynamics and acoustics, refrigeration, metallurgy, may come new methods for making new things for the years to come. But today, first and most important, Boeing builds for victory. Victory.